talk all things true crime. and shattered. The four-year-old, the parents have called in and us, but the mother has went for a wall, came home, now they can't find her. Turn it over to another agency. Chad, where are Lori's kids? They've been missing for four months. You have nothing to say? Four were stabbed multiple times and were likely asleep during the attack. Some had defensive wounds. Most of them had just like one that was the lethal uh, stab wound. Oh, what a tangled web we weave. Once I told a lie, then I told my family, I, I had to keep lying. Make sure I mean, is a demon. We haven't cleared anybody. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for another ATS News live stream. It's an hour later than normal tonight, but I'm so happy that all you guys are here up late with me for those who are on Eastern time. Hello, Allison. I saw Florida Bass Fishing, Tony, Adrian. I see Brady's here. You like the intro? Thank you. Thank you very much. I need to make a new outro. So that'll be something I can work on over the weekend. So Wokey is here. Okay, the party can get started now. Good to see you guys. Hi, Zoe and everyone else. Nicole, I see you guys. I just want to get into things because honestly, there's a lot to go through. Um, I believe my friend CDT will be joining us. So she will be appearing any minute now, but we'll get started. Hello, Mel Mac, everyone else. If you haven't hit the like button, please hit like and subscribe as well. It's greatly appreciated. I seen on my last live stream, there was really good feedback and I just really appreciate you guys being so kind. Um, I did want to welcome, I think Jody, thank you for becoming a member here. Really appreciate that. Johnny's here. Hello. And Zawoki gifting 10 memberships right off the bat. Thank you so much. That's a great way to get the live stream going. Hi, Angie. And welcome to the new members. Thank you so much. So, all right, let's get into what we're going to be discussing tonight. So all this information that we're going to be going through um, has been previously out there. Obviously, this case has been around since 2018. Um, a lot of us are very much hung up on specifics in this case that just don't make sense. In fact, the whole case in general for a lot of people is just very puzzling and confusing. So I think that it's interesting to go back to see what mainstream media was reporting at the time of everything before he signs the plea deal. So as you know, the murders take place in August. Um, on the 13th, we don't hear... Um, or see Chris in the public eye, except for his little court hearings here and there. And then he's in solitary confinement at the local jail. He's in the county jail. And throughout October, HLN had Ashley Banfield working for her at the time. And she was digging into this case very heavily. So I wanna go back through and look at some of those segments. Now, they're not going to be the same segments that you're used to seeing of HLN because I've edited my own like visuals in there. So to kind of mix it up a bit, because I know that a lot of people who have dug into this stuff have seen a lot of the stuff that was on the news. So to kind of keep it refreshed, um, I'll add new visuals to uh, their words and stuff, and then I can explain what the visuals are. Some of them will show something that has taken place after October 2018. So you might see like a picture from sentencing on the screen when the segment is from October and sentencing, of course, was in November. So it's just kind of be aware of that. You'll know that HLN didn't put that visual out themselves because they don't have like the banner on the bottom in their HLN picture. So anything that doesn't have that, I've added in. I'll pause. We can elaborate and go on further. And hello. Good to see you. Oh, I was muted. Hello. <laughs> and You're hey, fine. I just got <laughs> nervous that it was going to be... <laughs> You know, those bombs that we get every now and then on our live streams. Oh, man. Can you imagine if that happened? 
It would have been my fault because I didn't ask you to turn your camera on first. Right. But yeah. For anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, every now and then there'll be like a troll and it's a nude person. So I'll, we add them to our stream. We get ready to talk to them and it's a nude person and we have to shut the stream down. So I'm just so glad that didn't happen, but I was so scared for a split second. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. So I don't know if you heard, but I'm going to be playing some of those HLN clips that we've gone through before and just kind of bring a new take on some of it because some of the information they're talking about, um, we end up finding more information about that subject. So we can just go through and I hope you like what I have in store for us to kind of go through together. I am looking forward to it. And thank you, RP, for being a new member. And guys, I linked CDT's um, TikTok at the top of the chat. So if you could please follow her over there for more true crime, it'd be greatly appreciated. And yeah, it's just in TikTok form, which a lot of people like. And she does Watts and other stuff on there too. So, okay, well, let's get into <laughs> it. Florida Bass is being funny. Yeah. I only that stuff happens on your panels. I've yes. seen it happen on others though. It's just, it's a lot on mine. And I'm like such a, I don't know, kind of spastic. So I'm just like, come on up. And it always did not work out very well. <laughs> yeah. You guys had to be there for those. They yeah. were um, interesting. To um, say the least. All right. So Johnny's passing out the decaffeinated tea for everybody. So enjoy. And we'll get into this. Oh, Angie says she loves your TikTok. Oh, thank you, Angie. It's nice to see you over there. Okay, so I was saying that I added some of my own visuals. Obviously, you'll know, Kelly, because you've seen these segments before and you'll you'll realize that like, okay, this is a picture Amber added. So just to um, lay that out there, I'll be pausing too on some of the visuals too and asking, so Wokey, is, you just keep hitting the button over there. Like, is there a glitch or you're just being super generous? Did I miss the, the last 20 of them too? I'm sorry, I can't keep up. Thank you so much for gifting all those memberships. It's beyond um, generous and everyone in chat is loving it. So thank you so much. All right. So this is titled what the death investigator had to say about Nicole Kessinger. Um, it is Joseph Scott Morgan, If in case anybody didn't already uh, guess. Oh, nope. Just love to help. Thank you, Zawoki. And we appreciate everything you do over on your channel. And everyone, I think you guys are subscribed to Zawoki, but if you haven't subbed, please do so. He's posting a lot of Watts content too. And hello, Princess Mega Elsa. Everyone else who joined, thanks for being here. Criminality's up in the house. Somebody said, I'm scrolling up. If you're here, good to see you. Roxanne's here. All right, let's get into it. They were notoriously loving parents from the way their friends described them and from all the happy Facebook posts that showed off their family's more fun side. And they were no doubt the kind of parents who tucked their little girls into bed, maybe even still in those cute little pigtails they're often pictured in when they drifted off to sleep. But sometime between August 12th and August 13th, Bella and Cece had their last bedtime. Because whether you believe Chris or the police, it seems one of the parents killed those little girls, which might be why investigators were spotted doing this, hauling out all the bedding, sheets, comforters maybe, hauling it out of the house in what looked like trash bags in the days after the Watts girls died. The question now is what those bed sheets might actually reveal and if it could be incredibly telling. Joining me now, certified death investigator and professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan. Joe, I thought of you right away, uh, particularly when um, someone on the team on this program pointed out that those bags they were using. Okay, right off the bat, I have to pause it just because of the banner. Cops, meaning the cops are telling them this. Hubby kills wife and kids, dumps bodies. So then it's going to go on... Um, further with these weird banners and we'll be pausing on them. But at this time, Chris, this is October 11th. Um, Chris has not yet confessed to killing the kids. At this time, he has strictly only said that, you know, he added a fit of rage, which we know this is BS. 
um, after Tammy walked him into this confession, he says he had to do it because Shanann killed the girls. So I just find it interesting and very much we'll go into what they kind of talk about here is how his lawyers at the time were fighting to say that there's no way at this point that he could be given a fair trial. Like um, his constitutional rights have been impeded on. There was uh, leaks coming from the district attorney's office, apparently some of these banners say. And I believe that that has to do with um, cops and law enforcement telling the media that he confessed to everything when he actually hadn't. What do you take on this little banner? Like, cause it's saying that the cops told them this. Right. I find it frustrating. And once again, I do not believe if you even want to call it Chris's first confession. Like I do not believe Shanann harmed the kids at all, but I also find it very frustrating that like you were saying, the way that the media spun it and likely Honestly, Tammy and Coder are the ones who claimed, okay, he confessed to it all when he hadn't. Um, and then, yeah, this banner, plus there were other media reports that we've spoken about immediately, like husband confesses and he had it. And it's just, again, frustrating that that can happen and that it did happen here. And the, the thing too is, to this day, and they kind of touch on it a little bit already, like at this moment in October, there was already Facebook groups popping up to discuss this case. Like we've seen in yes. Idaho before and other um, cases, and they already get into discussing how people started to think that Shanann was um, the perpetrator for the children. And I can't help but wonder if there weren't like troll accounts going through because at that point, the confession tape hadn't even been made public. I think the arrest affidavit slowly became public, which states the um, the true confession that he had that night that Shanann killed the girls. So she he killed Shanann. And I think that maybe that kind of sparked speculation in these groups because that came out and people kind of wondered like, wow, I wonder if that's true. And then they go down this rabbit hole of like, hmm, yeah, she did seem, and this is just so stupid. She did seem bossy. So that means that she could be a killer. Like it just, it just spiraled out of control. And I can't help but wonder if there were, weren't like trolls in there from like NK's camp or even law enforcement's camp kind of pushing this like narrative of um, he confessed everything. And then also like she possibly could have done it, you know? Yeah. I tend to agree. And I mean, also kind of going back to finding out that Tammy's husband had made that Facebook post. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would not be surprised if there were members of Ellie and NK's camp in there doing things. Yeah. And we'll have to show those screenshots in our next live stream. But yeah, there was just really um, questionable, unprofessional posts done by Tammy's husband before, mm -hmm. you know, real proceedings had started taking place, um, praising her for catching like the family killer or something like that, or like pretty much emphasizing that he confessed to everything when he hadn't. Right. And that Tammy had basically worked tirelessly to get that confession kind of thing. We'd need to review it, but Something along those lines, it was just very unprofessional. Mm -hmm. And again, I think like with a proper, again, I don't want to defend Chris per se, but like with a proper defense team, that would not have looked good at all. Right. And also the fact that he delete, the husband deletes the post too. So right. <laughs> these screenshots of this post. And then all of a sudden, like it wasn't there anymore. It's like if if nothing was said that shouldn't have been said, then why delete it? You know, um, exactly. And something that I also was somebody had shown me. Hold on. I just want to make sure I can find the link. I'll keep playing this. But if I if I remember correctly, that new article that came out, remember we were reading from it and played um, Scott Rice reading from it or narrating it where it was talking about NK had a new younger guy yes. that she was with. Yeah. And it mentioned the Rourke's um, podcast or whatever in it. Mm -hmm. Apparently, if I can remember, if I can find the link, that link no longer works. Like it's, it's been taken down. 
So oh, wow. That's still the truth. Cause a sub subscriber like pointed it out and said, the link isn't working for me. And then I checked it and it was something I posted too. And I think that that article is like now scrubbed. So that is just wild. <laughs> like this case is so bizarre the way things disappear and are just so twisted I feel yeah it was like that whole article pretty much saying um that she was a victim and all this stuff hold on mm -hmm. I think I got the link right here yep from the messenger remember and we were like hmm, wonder what the messenger is hold on I'll show you guys yeah and, and isn't the podcast uh D.A. Rourke's wife's podcast gone as well that's what i heard but it i have the link still to it and it's still working okay so i don't Good know how podcasts really work like does the link just stay around like a unlisted video for youtube like if you have yeah. it still works i don't know um but so this was two weeks ago and I have like the screenshots from the article, not the whole article. And I'm annoyed that I didn't like screenshot the whole thing. But um, Colorado dad killed his family to be with a mistress. Now he's in prison and she's in hiding, dating younger man. And um, we went over the article. We uh, went into detail about it. And then I put here's the full article. Click on it. Of course, I got to sh share my screen again. And this is what it does. So I don't know why. Weird. Thank you, Kez Chick, for becoming a member. But yeah, the, it, apparently it's gone. So mm. not sure why. And, and it was sourced in there that they had spoken with one of NK's family members. Thank you, Brody, for this um, one month banner for being a member here. So thank you be part of ATS News as a member. Thank you for being here. Um, so I don't know if, if nothing was wrong about that article, why is it gone? You know, agree, agreed. And that's happened. I know through our years together on this case, like I know I have messaged you like, okay, I saw this video within this article with this link and now it leads to some other thing. Like there was some interview that, or something that it had. And then like it, I don't know. They just like seem to, things disappear. Mm-hmm. Hello, Marshall Dove. And that's the thing, too, is if something that we've kind of always pointed out, too, in this case is like there was a lot of fake news being being said and reported. And yet what can you do as soon as you start hearing a story and it perpetuates over and over like that picture of that guy in the orange shirt? And it came out like yes. Chris Watts ordering breakfast after he committed the crimes and it wasn't Chris Watts like people's to this day still are like no I saw that CCTV video of him and it's like that wasn't him right so it's just very frustrating and some of the fake news is like out there still so it's like confusing some of it gets scrubbed and then other ones just keep like popping up it's like, what kind of narrative are they hoping to keep pushing? Because that one about he ordered breakfast, how cold and heartless. It's like, no, he left work and drove right home. We have the body cam footage. And like, we have the information from the discovery that shows like his stops. Not once did he stop at that alleged gas station. And that's him in the footage, you know? Right. And again, that's something that is in the evidence, like his geotab and his truck. So it's just interesting, like, who put that out there? How did it get so big? Because, like you said, I still see people who think that that was Chris. Mm-hmm. Incredibly see-through. And I want to just draw our viewers' attention uh, to the close-ups, um, the close-up images of the bags. Because we could see it. We could see it clear as day that not only did it have the appearance of the shape of bedding and the softness, but the bag seemed to be easy to spot. I mean, I, I think we've got a good image of it, a nice close image of, um, uh, let's see, that's not the one, but it, we'll, we'll get there in a second. But when you do see it, you, you tend to start seeing what might look like um, pink and yellow and blue comforters or sheets or blankets. And we actually compared them. There were plenty of those kinds of, um, you know, bed dressings all throughout the house. It's kind of fascinating, but can sheets and bedding really forensically tell us anything like fingerprints and pressure and who might have killed the children? Can we really get there from 
from fabric? Uh, well, yeah. You know, one of the, the things that's kind of left me scratching my head about this case is that anybody that would play fast and loose with their marriage, I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking uh, that the police are entertaining the thought that there could be other parties involved. You have to at least explore that. So he's pretty much saying, you know, professional in the field of death investigations, you have to explore the idea that someone from outside this family household could have done this crime or, you know, even helped or, you know, um, conspired. So I just think it's interesting when people will make those comments like, oh, leave NK alone, like the district attorney, leave NK alone. She was a victim. This isn't a witch hunt. Um, you armchair detectors, detectives need to give it a rest. There's no physical evidence pointing towards NK. And yet at the same sense, there's no physical evidence linking Chris. All we have is his confession and the fact that he signed a plea deal admitting it to it. And the confession he gave was a false confession because we know that Shanann didn't kill the girls. So it's very problematic. And a recent poll that I had seen in a true crime group, not even related to Watts, talked about um, what evidence is, you know, you should hang your hat on or what evidence you really think, you know, is is good evidence. And the top two were obviously DNA. And then the other one was forensic um, digital evidence, you know, like cell phone stuff, computer stuff, um, maybe even a phone GPS kind, or a car GPS, like locating you near the crime, stuff like that. And then the last two on the list that were just not reliable and had like the lowest on the poll was confessions and then eyewitness accounts. So it's interesting to me that a lot of people will say, he confessed, he confessed. And yet that's really not that great of evidence, especially when the evidence isn't matching the, or when the confession isn't matching the evidence, you know, they wouldn't have found anything that would tie Shanann to killing the kids. And they hadn't. I completely agree with everything you said. Like, and then like I always say, like a broken record, everybody is picking and choosing what they believe from Chris. And there is absolutely no DNA evidence, nothing. And then for Joseph Scott Morgan, who is a death investigator, and he's saying that, yeah, like, look how fast this seemed to happen. The police have to be you know, probably looking at outliers. Well, who was the outlier? That would be NK. Who's the one who lied right off the bat in her very first interview? That would be NK. Who deleted and hampered the investigation? Uh, that would be NK. But yet no more information about her from the DA, just leave her alone. Trust me when he's changed his narrative as well. So it's, this is all extremely frustrating. And when you think about if if digital evidence and DNA are the most trustworthy evidence for anybody to rely on in a case, it's unfortunate and troubling that we have no information or evidence from Chris's phone. All we have is his conversations um, here and there picked and chosen in the discovery from his phone. Like it'll say Watts deleted X, Y, Z after this message or something like that. You know, we don't have like a full fledged, like this is, you know, like we do for the Gypsy Rose case, which was also a plea deal. Um, you'll see the whole conversations between Nick and Gypsy and they can pull deleted information. So there's no excuse to say, well, NK deleted stuff. She got rid of her SIM card. Um, all that could have been pulled and gone through and should still be kind of given to us in regards to, at least from Chris's phone, like he claims he didn't delete anything. You know, what if he really didn't? And there is stuff on his phone that the public just has not been shown. So yes. one of the top pieces of evidence, the phone data is sealed and kept secret from us. We don't have anything from Chris's phone, basically. 
um, the Vivint records, which is the security system, which would show us if there was activity in the house when Chris wasn't there, when Nicole Atkinson was there, but not inside, or when she left to go to the doctor's office to see if Shanann was there. Um, that could show us if somebody else was moving in the house. Um, and all that is sealed too. So DNA, fingerprints, all that never got processed completely. And the digital information has been hidden from the public. So I think that people need to start realizing that he confessed, he did it. Like that's really not, um, to me, 100% like, well, that must be it. Especially when you have somebody like him who, you know, said, when Tammy said, chicks are crazy, did Shanann do anything? And he said, no, no, no. Like, wasn't in, it wasn't like the first time uh, Tammy asked him that. He was like, yeah, you know, definitely. It was, it was her. He said no, like numerous times. And then finally, after being badgered about it, he was like, yes. Like, tell, told his dad. Like, they leave the room. Dad comes in. And then he says, she, you know, so I. And it's like that's not even like a real confession, really, you know, like he just yeah, kind of really not. <laughs> agreed to what Tammy said to his father. And then they come like in and they're like, Oh, you know? Um, and that night when he was arrested, it was on suspicion of murder. So like mm -hmm. those were the exact charges was suspicion of murder. So it's all very troubling that we don't have the digital evidence we need to clear NK. Um, we don't have really anything in regards to real evidence in this case. And and we have a lot of circumstantial evidence, but the problem is we have a lot of circumstantial evidence that point to NK like being involved more. So it's very much like, yeah, we used to be able to convict people on circumstantial before the technology was there. But here we have means to go further than um, circumstantial and it's being kept from the public. And it's just, you know, that's all that, that we do is kind of point out like, this just doesn't seem right. And a lot of people like just realize like, yeah, that something is missing as far as the truth in this case. I agree. And if anyone wants to look up a case with a false confession and a botched investigation, look up Kevin Fox and Riley Fox. Um, I won't get into it, but just look up the name Kevin Fox and Riley Fox, and it will show you how false confessions can happen and how police absolutely can botch investigations. And, you know, people kind of have like an issue sometimes when I call Chris's confession false because they're like, well, right. it's tactic. It, you know, they knew that he didn't kill Shanann. But the thing is, that's what he was arrested on. His PCA literally has the, which yes. do it in the last one. So if you have probable cause to arrest him, you know, that should kind of match out um, as close to the truth. Or, you know, obviously it was enough for the court to say like, OK, yeah, I guess we can we'll go further and everything can get cleared up at his trial. Well, that trial never happened. So, right. And then my thing with the way I know you've talked quite a bit about the re technique and like my biggest thing with that, like the way Tammy went about it is in this case, there were so many other avenues and options than blaming Shanann. So many, they were literally at the oil field. They had previously located the spot that had been um, where Shannon's body they his truck like they could have been like no one else is on that camera we can see your truck like we're at your site what are we gonna find there it's like they didn't use any of that against him and he even said in prison like she's like you weren't giving us anything and he's like well maybe if you would have used i don't know the truck or <laughs> something like i just don't think that tammy needed to go down that way with this case at all and they knew about the affair at that moment yes so you know about an affair. Yep. You're a state agent investigating a quadruple homicide, which, by the way, District Rourke called this a triple homicide, didn't even include Nico. But I that's know. a fact. Um, 
So quadruple homicide, you know, you serve, you swore an oath to serve and protect. You know, there's an outlier in this case, which is what Joseph Scott Morgan was talking about. Like they got to be entertaining the idea that an outlier had something to do with this. And yet that's when I, I really do think like she had struck her deal already at that point. And Tammy and them were told like, no, she's going to be our witness for this case. Um, we, she told us X, Y, Z, and it was, it was beneficial. You know, it was just some BS deal that was made. Um, maybe she batted her eyes at Rourke too. Who knows, you know, but for Tammy to go after Shanann, to me, is like, she knew that there, she allowed this deal to kind of hinder her own duty that she swore to protect, serve and protect. Yeah. Like she didn't have to go down the avenue of um, Shanann, like you said. There, even right. if she didn't want to go down MK because she struck yeah. a deal or whatever, there's other things that could have been done. But for some reason, she just had it in her, Tammy, that she was not going home that night without Chris confessing to killing Shanann because Shanann killed the girls. Right. It's unbelievable. Like, I don't know what. It's quiet. Like, like, read the suspect. Like, Chris was agreeing to literally everything, and they didn't even get him into the station for an interview. They, they got Scott Peterson in there that night. Like, Chris was saying yes to absolutely everything. Yeah, he said, and, um, um, yep, he was cooperative with, like, the dog search, with the house search, with everything. I mean, I'm sure they had to ask him to go look in the Lexus and stuff. It just makes no sense. All right, let's get back. Oh, sorry. Your, your audio is cutting out a little bit. So I don't know if you were saying something. Um, I'm sorry. I don't know why, but no, I wasn't. Um, I was going to say now though, that I think the next thing that Banfield, Ashley Banfield is about to say is, oh, I bet the girl from Anna Darko is shaking in her boots. <laughs> so that, I think she says that in this interview. Sorry, I didn't realize it was muted. I was saying that basically, um, Ashley Banfield leaves HLN. I don't know if she was fired or what, but right after her reporting on the Watts case, and she was like one of the only reporters that was going in on um, Nicole Kessinger. And then she loses yes. her job. So I don't know if any of that is tied together, but interesting timing to lose your job. I agree. Would play fast and loose with their marriage. Um, I'm, I'm still thinking uh, that the police are entertaining the thought that there could be other parties involved. You have to at least explore that. And so that brings us to this issue of individualization of evidence. And one of the things that we go to now, particularly, are, 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 is DNA sample. And I want to know, you know, we've heard the, the term cohabitating, that these people are living in this dwelling together. They're domiciled there. But is there some kind of outlier that is coming into this home that may have had contact that helped facilitate some of these events that's not part of the familial unit? So mm. that's something that we would want to take a look at. Boy, as that, that lady at work's I'm probably sorry, shaking in her boots right now, if that's the case, because she, if she were ever in that uh, marital bed uh, and there's any DNA to prove it, that just puts her square in the middle of a murder trial, doesn't it? But before you answer that, yeah. I actually want to get back to the key question here. The key yeah, question sure. is that Chris Watts says Shanann was strangling those kids, and he saw it on the baby monitor, which would put Shanann in the rooms of both kids over their beds, right? Is there a way to possibly tell that from the bedding? Or is there any other reason that they might be able to find out the real story from the bedding? Well, I think that that they want to check out every every inch of this bedding because obviously he's alluded to this, uh, that there was specific contact. And hey, at the end of the day, people in court are going to want to hear this. Uh, you know, you've got this last place identified by him uh, as as the as the point where these children allegedly met their demise. So yeah, you're going to have to examine it and see what is there. 
Is there hair there? Uh, is there evidence of DNA? And I'm thinking about things like, uh, say, for instance, there's injuries to the throat and it caused them to regurg regurgitate sputum in some way where we have maybe a mix of blood and sputum there. That's not that's something not you would tell me whose hands. That, but that's not going to tell me whose hands. Let me ask you something. And you know what's interesting, too, is how she's so interested in knowing whose hands because in the confession or the PCA, it mentioned that he was or she was strangling the girls. So his lawyers put in a file during this time before the plea deal and said, we want the children's necks to be swabbed and we want like the results. Like we want our own experts to go in there and swab their nets. And the court denied it. How, yes. are, how are you denying people looking for DNA? Right. That makes zero sense. It really doesn't. And we can get into that on the next live stream, like deeper into that, because there's a lot of articles on it. But, you know, here, Joseph Scott Morgan's like talking about DNA being present and, and Ashley Bansfield's like, that's not going to tell me who whose hands were there, blah, blah, blah. So they go to go down that avenue in a legal aspect and the court says, nope, we're not allowing you to swab their necks looking for DNA. Like, it's just little things like that, that like when this was taking place and I seen somebody asked when this was this, this report is October, 2018. So just a little over, I don't know, it's like two months after he's um, been arrested. Um, and it also said something like autopsy report to be released soon. So I didn't expect and I don't expect on active cases for them to, you know, reveal the whole autopsy. But apparently at this time, like two months later, they they didn't know the cause of death from anyone. Now, they said they have it in the PCA that Chris saw the girls being strangled. So that's kind of the narrative that everyone kind of was jumping on, like, oh, OK, maybe they were strangled. Um, and Chris himself like says that he strangled them too. come to find out like, no, they were asphyxiated by smothering. So it's just interesting how like even that aspect of the confession and, and statements that Chris had made in the prison interview about strangling them. It's like, yeah, but that's not how they died. Um, just don't match the evidence, you know, and and here, like, do you guys think it's weird? You know, if we're going to go back to 2018 and Kelly, imagine like the. Um, Idaho four case, you know, they didn't give us the autopsies, obviously, but we knew that their manner of death and cause of death was stabbing, you know? So here, right. The public, the media, everyone is in the dark about how these people died. And like, to me, that's strange. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah. It is interesting when you kind of compare cases yeah. And yeah, I never really thought about it all like that. That's a really interesting point. It's like so much was being kept hush hush in this case that it's just like there was no need for it. You know, mm -hmm. like why can't you tell us that actually like the girls were obviously the medical examiner like knew. And, and even for Shanann, her not being in the oil must have made it much more. Um, clear of like what had happened to her and it said that her in her autopsy that there was like mild to moderate decomp so it wasn't beyond the realm of like no it was skeletal remains you know what I mean and yet it just was so hush hush and I, I think I understand Banfield's like frustration in some of these segments I didn't put all of them in because some of them I'm just like okay I don't want to go through the, all these Facebook posts and stuff but she was really digging into like aspects of this case that like for some reason Colorado did not seem pleased with yeah like you said the fact she got let go right around this time is interesting mm -hmm. and hello Chase and I saw um other people joining thank you guys for being here a dog had hit in the basement that's where I think she was ambushed so that dog that hit, they get another dog to do the confirmation and the next dog didn't hit. So it's like some of the hits that they hit on are, weren't backed up by like a confirmation hit and all this stuff. But I do think that something did take place in the basement. I just don't know what, I don't know if maybe that's where people were hiding and she was ambushed on there or if she was taken out the basement or if 
it's really hard to know. Um, Cause the only reason why I would say is like, maybe she was taken out the basement is because the back door had like a Vivian alert on it, but I think that he had shut off the Vivian at the time. So I guess it wouldn't have mattered, but I don't really know a hundred percent. Um, and it would be nice to know a hundred percent and we could know a hundred percent, but they've sealed that information to give us every clear, clarified Vivian alert and activity in the house. So another puzzling thing about Colorado. And so many people have commented and said like, we don't trust Colorado, especially after how they acted in the John Bonet case. And it's like, I, I mean, I, I hate to lump them all together, but sometimes things and issues in cities and, and states are like a systematic, like um, generational thing, you know? Yeah, for sure. Something else that... I would not I would not have noticed it and I dare say people watching right now would not have noticed it but your trained eye did. Let's go yeah. back to those plastic bags that were coming out of the house. They use these what look like big old trash bags but for the fact that they are super see-through. Um and you have an issue with that. What is it? Yeah, I do. Um been doing this for a long time, Ash. I've been training cops, been training forensic investigators for a long time. Um one of the big no-go areas is we don't put things in plastic. And why is that? Well, you've got fragile biological evidence and you place stuff in plastic bags, those bags begin to sweat and it can compromise the integrity of the biological sample. That's uh, why I always that's see the paper bags. Skin. I always see the picture of the big paper bags coming out of people's houses. I yeah. never thought you could fit bedding in, but just show that video of the different size of evidentiary yeah. bags that you have. I mean, pay, look at the one on the far right. You could get all the bedding into one of those. That's what you should be using, right? Yeah, yeah, the paper bag, you know, it doesn't promote sweating. And and this is another thing. Um, I'm not a big fan of commingling evidence. Let's say, for instance, we've got sheets uh, comforters, uh, maybe even a mattress pad. Those things should be individually packaged oh, and point. individually enumerated at the scene before they're removed. Okay. Now, you know, That's I don't know what their procedure is. I, I have no idea. But yeah. it in a class that I would teach, I would teach them not to use separate uh, bag for every like piece. Plastic. You know, it makes sense to me. And, and you know, what's interesting era is like, we kind of went through something that we, when we were looking through the discovery, they were talking about how they released the house to Frederick PD and like uh, CBI took over at Survey 319. And we kind of were like, hmm, I wonder if that means that they know like, okay, we'll give this area to the local police because the real crime scene is here. And that's where all of our like state resources and, and experts should really be focusing on. So when you say, I guess the sheets weren't evidence then, it's either they didn't see it as like very big evidentiary value. And so they just treated it that way or they're incompetent and they're not doing protocols that they should like the paper bags um, and say it's both where there was no evidence on it because they know that Shanann didn't kill the girls. Um, so they put him in that. But uh, at the same time, Chris admits that his defense attorneys were going to use that Shanann killed the girls um, theory. So I wonder if they bagged it up as like, oh, yeah, this doesn't have very much evidentiary value to it because the crime scene was at Survey 319. Nothing happened here at the house. Everyone, nobody died in the house. I really think nobody died in the house, too. But I'm wondering if like that was their thought process and being so lazy and um, careless. And then I'm wondering if as time goes on, they start realizing like, what? So the defense team is going to use that false confession that Shanann killed the girls as their defense. Oh, great. We just kind of destroyed that evidence. Like we didn't take it out like we should have. So now we can't even disprove that the theory that Shanann killed the girls. What do you think, Kelly? Yeah, that's an interesting thought process. Um, because you're so right. Like, and I do feel like that that is kind of one of the factors as to why they pushed the plea deal, because the evidence and the, the collection of the evidence was so botched that they, like you said, like, oh, if <laughs> like we didn't do this correctly, if it had gone forward and they had released the house so quickly, collected things incorrectly, that's not a good look at all. 
Um, but then also, like you said, like it could be the dogs went through and they're like, okay, we don't think anything actually happened here. So they weren't very careful with it. But either way, this collecting the sheets into plastic is just so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it just is like the perfect defense for the defense team to say, like, I mean, look at you guys handling yes. the evidence here. Um, are we to assume that you followed protocol for every step of the way? Because we have video of you on the media here not following protocol. So to have one juror in their mind kind of wonder, like, hmm, did they, like, mishandle evidence in this case? Are they incompetent? Like, can we trust this um, investigative team? Um that would just raise too much doubt for a juror. And, and I think district attorney, you know, was watching stuff like this HLN report and like seeing like an expert, like the death investigator pretty much saying like, you should be looking at an outlier. You know, this guy was having an affair. Like I can't imagine they're not. And he's cut this girl a plea deal at, or a, a immunity deal at this point. And like mainstream media is saying like, look over at this person. Like, why aren't you? Or you should be. I just think like things started um, crumbling on top of district attorney Rourke. And he was like, I, I don't know if I could win this at a trial now. I do agree with that. I do. Something we went into our last live stream talking about was um, the statement, an article that came out years ago that Nicole Kessinger said that some of the last text messages Chris sent to her, one of them said, I did not hurt my family, Nikki. And we kind of discussed that. And then I included this little part in the um, interrogation where he pretty much says over and over, like, I didn't hurt my family. I didn't hurt my kids. And I'm just I'm just saying it's interesting that he told Nicole that. And then he's also very adamant about that to Tammy. Yeah. And again, like when we kind of went into his confession and like really, or not confession, his false confession, his interview, we'll call it, with Tammy and Coder. Um, just the way he kept saying over and over, like, I did not hurt them. I did not hurt those girls. And I know some people are like, how can he call them those girls? Like, whatever, you know, he called them. I don't know, the way he just kept saying over and over that he did not do that mm -hmm. just has always stuck out with me or to me. And then once again, I'm not just going off of my thoughts based on that one part. It's the way he was saying that versus the way he said other things, right? And then again, just the evidence. And it is interesting to think back like to his text message to NK about that and then him repeating that with Tammy and Coder. Mm -hmm. And we never see that text message. Right. Um, which is problematic too, I guess, in believing that he had said that. But if if he did say that, then that mimics exactly what he's pretty much saying in his interrogation too for so long um, before caving and agreeing with Tammy. And, you know, Tammy says something like, okay, so, so you're okay. It got to the point where I think Tammy like realized, like, I think I dug myself like a hole. Yes. Because I think she, she really wanted him to walk it back. And yeah. She, yeah, like she's like, so you're really okay with this? You're okay with this? And I think I'm with you. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no. I'm with you. Like, I think she was like, uh oh, <laughs> here we go. Like, I should be able to get him to fold and say that he did it all at this point, but he's not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's just like leaving it on Shanann. And I think that that kind of attests to how detached and how done he was with Shanann which is why I really think like this whole plan, obviously he's involved. He's where he should be. I still don't think that the children were in his initial plans. I think that they were collateral damage. They witnessed too much that day. The cops showed up. So the whole plan kind of went haywire. Um, we've gone into all that before, but pretty much him just, be, even to this day, blaming Shanann for the girls. It's like in his family doing the same thing. Um, it, just shows me like, yeah, he was just, he had so much built up resentment against her for whatever reason, you know, it's because his family didn't like her. They never went to their wedding. Hi, Valerie. It's good to see you. And hello, Jody is cool. And everyone else who joined. But I, again, I think that there's so many things that show like Chris definitely had like a direct involvement with Shanann's death. 
but I just don't see it for the children. And that's just my opinion. Right. And I, th I think the same. And I used to comment it in Facebook groups and got a lot of people who thought I was ridiculous and I loved Chris and blah, blah, blah. But no, I, I have felt that for a very long time after studying the case and studying the interviews. I just don't, I'm not convinced that Chris harmed the girls. I do think he might have, um, you know, done what he did to Shanann. I still not totally sure on that one, but I 100% just am not sold on him harming his girls. Yeah, I agree. And there's still comments. I think I got it in my last live stream, like stop taking blame away from him and putting it on um, other people. And I'm like, it's not putting more blame. It's not taking away from blame on him. You know exactly. what I mean? No. So I don't understand that whole like point that they try to make. It's like, if other people were involved, then other people should go down as well. Or at least if they, if nobody else ever gets arrested or looked into you guys realize that like there is corruption in like district attorneys that are going to be shady. And like, you just can't always believe what the mainstream is feeding you. I want to believe that maybe Shanann did it and you felt compelled to fix this. So Shanann didn't look bad. That's what I, that's what I want to believe. But I don't know, you're not telling me that, so it makes me think the worst. Like, did you I did not do that to all three of them? I did like, not do anything in this case. Not do anything. What did Shanann do? Tell us, Chris. Chicks are crazy. So you're good with the public knowing that Shanann killed her daughters? I did not hurt these girls. Are you okay with the public knowing that Shanann killed Yes, because I did not hurt these girls. Monsters. I didn't kill my babies. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Begin with breaking news right off the top of this program. So this is going back to still October, but it's it's before the last one that we just watched with Joseph Scott Morgan. And hello, Jay. It's good to see you. I see you said you were late, but late, better late than never. And hello, Kathy. With regard to that case in Colorado, that case, the Watts case, it turns out there are a lot of developments in that case. Those autopsies, now almost two months since those two little girls were murdered and their mother died as well. And finally, finally, the autopsies are finished, delivered and sealed to the prosecutor. And so this statement, obviously, I added this visual myself. Um, Chris Watts guilty plea. This statement was made after this segment. So when I said that sometimes the visuals aren't going to align with what Banfield's reporting on, this is one of them. This is after he's signed the plea deal. Um, and he's asked about Nicole Kessinger, the district attorney attorney said, Chris Watts's guilty plea precluded any further probe. The results of forensic analysis of Kessinger's phone. So he pretty much, like many other people, blame, including Tammy. She said the same thing. Like, well, when he signed that plea deal, the clock stopped and we could no longer investigate. So that's pretty much District Attorney Rourke's um, narrative as well. You know, blame Chris because that's what everyone does anyways. But it to me, it's not an excuse. You know, there's no reason why you couldn't have continued and maybe prosecuted somebody else for being involved in a for a quadruple homicide, you know, a pregnant right. woman, just so vile and like the, the oil and all that. Like, this is the type of case that you like nail everybody who's involved. Yep. Like you said, I mean, she was pregnant. And then the way in which the children were disposed of, like that is another level of just like evil on top of what had already been done. And the close up, like, you know, that kind of manner of death too. It's very personal. 
and psycho babble. We appreciate your opinion. Everyone is desperate to want to believe Nikki had a hand in this. <laughs> no, I don't I'd rather her not. I'd rather not believe that. But <laughs> after years of researching, I think there's more to it. Not because I want to believe it, but that's what the research is leading me to. <laughs> right, exactly. It's like desperate. That's no. quite a word delivered to the defense attorney in the hands of the lawyers as we speak it has been a long fought process what could have taken all that time for autopsies to be delivered as far as you and me we don't get to know what's in those autopsies we don't even know cause of death it's because it's sealed but it doesn't mean it's sealed forever that is still up in the air isn't it funny how she said the autopsies are sealed, but that doesn't mean it's going to be sealed forever. Oh, yeah, honey, it is actually. It actually does. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny, like the the assurance that because it's just the norm in cases, you know, like right. You get somebody convicted, you put in a Freedom of Information Act, or um, I don't know what the media does. They like apply for their own information that they gather. And you get to see like, okay, yeah, this is the full report. Instead, in this case, um, Chris is is told in his plea deal, like, well, we'll keep some of it sealed. And it's like part of his deal to have part of the autopsies sealed. And it's like, how do you do that? And, and not only that, like, how funny is it to kind of look at this in hindsight and see like how sure Ashley was like, oh, well, it won't be sealed forever. Yeah, it is. So when people are like, oh, you know, Chris did all this himself. How can you know without the full autopsy reports? And the fact right. that the judge said like no to the defense team when they said we want to do our own DNA swabbing of the necks of the children. And the judge says no to that. It's like there's no way that you can have 100 percent reassurance that he acted alone. Right, exactly. Tiny ghost. Red flag. As to when we will know cause of death. And there is even more breaking news to tell you about tonight. And that is that Shanann Watts did not have a will. We know this because important paperwork has just been filed. It's her probate paperwork, her family, the family that came to Colorado to tie up loose ends, to pick up some of her things and the children's things from that home and to attend a memorial service. Looks like they are also filing important paperwork to hash out just what goes where now that she is dead, Bella's dead, Cece's dead, and Chris Watts is still alive. And you know what's interesting too is like, it might have meant nothing really to kind of report on the fact that she had no will. But when you look at like a motivation for Chris, um, I mean, come to find out she didn't really have many assets anyways, except she had life insurance from her previous marriage that was still uh, an active policy that had over a hundred thousand dollar payout. Um, and the fact that he also had life insurance on her as well. You know, no will, I guess, whatever she did own automatically would just go to Chris. So say that he never got like arrested for her murder. If the plan was, you know, acted out appropriately and he never got caught and she just, you know, was um, killed in the explosion. In my opinion, that was the plan or however you guys think it was supposed to go down where he never got caught. Um everything would have gone right to Chris. Like he would have been the beneficiary. So they're talking about the court documents that show that she had no will. And that was like the breaking news at this time. But when you look at it like deeper, you realize like, okay, so there was nothing in there that said her brother, her mom or dad, were going to take um, her assets and stuff. So it was, it was, everything was to gain for Chris basically. Does that make sense? Do you know what I mean though? Yeah, it does. Just um, if you do wonder, like, was money the motivator? This kind of can prove a little bit to that theory that, like, every Chris was was set to inherit, I guess, everything. Right. 
I want to bring in Kyle Peltz, our crime and justice producer, who's just gotten his hands on these documents. There's a lot that's in here that's interesting, and there's a lot that's in here that isn't. But what might be missing that's fascinating is the fact there's no will. Right. Um, we know Shanann's family, as we reported, was in Colorado uh, last week moving items from the house. Um, now now we know they were also at the courthouse, apparently dealing with the fact that Shanann did not have a will. So what's fascinating in these documents, I'm, I'm noting, is some of the, the technical language that most people wouldn't think twice about when filling out a formal piece of court uh, paperwork, check off boxes, uh, perfunctory questions and answers. But some of these are, are really sad. I mean, when I look at them, I, I look at them with a, a completely different prism now, uh, given the fact that they're having to fill out who survived her. And I think maybe what's most telling is that they had to they had to fill out who didn't survive her. Right, and I think we have a graphic of this, but there's a line, um, and it stuck out to me as well, in these uh, probate documents where um, it asked if Shanann had any surviving children, and uh, there's a box checked no. Um, also notable, and you can see it there, Chris Watts, uh, his address there is listed as the Weld County Jail now. I also noticed uh, deep in the paperwork that these, these uh, documents have been delivered. Uh, they were sent by mail to him, and I think they were sent like several days ago as well. So he's probably reading this material over, maybe in the hour out room, given he's not allowed to have reading material in his cell. But he's reading over these documents, realizing that he's not the only game in town right now when it comes to all of the things that technically, uh, you know, belonged to Shanann. So yeah, Johnny, I really think that there was like a money objective here with him killing her. Um, the kids also had life insurance, but it was nothing like the policy that Shanann had. So even if you don't think that the kids were in the plan, it to me, it, it seems more worthwhile her amount that she was worth for, especially the ex-husband's um, policy that she still had active from that marriage. Um, so I just really believe like not only was he after the life insurance money, but this explosion at work um, could have resulted in, you know, a lawsuit against Anna Darko. And I also believe that there's a possibility that there was um, people. Uh, now, we don't know who owns stock in, in the oil company, but I do think, and this is for another time, that maybe they were going to play um manipulate the stocks so either they were gonna buy in when it was super low because the explosion that took place the year prior the stocks dropped and like the stock the shareholders sued Anna Darko because they were like we lost all this money with our stocks dropping because of this explosion that was your guys's fault like we didn't know you guys weren't following safety protocols so we want that money back so I think that there's room for you to even speculate, like, were they going to play with like the stock markets with the oil field or the oil company as well? Again, that's over people's heads who don't really know um, stocks and stuff like that. But I think that that does come into play somehow based on a post from Nicole Kessinger's friend that she made talking about oil stocks. Now, again, that's another time, but yeah, I think money was definitely the motivator in um, this case. Longed to the family. Three quarters of that family is dead now. This is not an easy, um, this isn't an easy formula, is it, for them to sift through? No, it's not. Um, the big question is who owns uh, what in that house? Um, who it belongs to. They had a lot of expensive things, too. Oh, they had many expensive things in their house. Um, even their house uh, yeah. was a very expensive home. She had a, a Lexus. I, I don't know that it was fully paid for. That was something she was getting $800 a month, I think, from uh, Thrive, the company where she worked. Uh, he had a truck. Uh, it was confiscated. The police took it. I don't think it's ever been returned anywhere. We've certainly never seen it parked back out in front of that, that house. Do they ever list any of the assets? Um, in the probate uh, paperwork to suggest what what they're looking at or what they're what the family is listing that she actually has right there's a section in this uh court filing that actually um you know uh it's a box where you can list how much your home's worth and property and all of that is actually left blank in these documents i'm seeing it here estimated value of real estate 
and it's left blank. And we think that home was somewhere in the three hundred, maybe four hundred dollar range, if four hundred thousand dollar range, if That's I exactly recall. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, and then estimated value of personal property. Well, Shanann had to have had a lot of personal property, her own personal things, her family mementos that the family said to us they came to get. They came to collect some of the things that were heirlooms passed down, uh, Shanann's personal things. Look at the things in the background of all of these videos. You know, expensive things, expensive furniture and vases and, and picture frames and art on the wall. I mean, there's a lot of expensive stuff in there, but the estimated value of personal property is listed as? There's nothing. Blank. You might not have seen her in years, especially since she... Now, we end up finding out um, later down the road that there was a lot of debt. They were, they were on their way towards a second bankruptcy filing. So I think that that might have a lot to do with like the paperwork they're looking at at the time that pretty much said like she didn't have any assets. But that's not really like a conversation that we're going to get into because it's just, it is what it is, you know? And that almost kind of points towards him being motivated to... Um, for this in a financial way too, because of how bad in debt and, um, you know, filing for bankruptcy the first time wasn't in his plan, I'm sure. And the fact that they were headed that way again, you know, that almost adds to this whole like motivation to, to do this for the, the life insurance money, in my opinion. And I think that this was all kind of pointed out by NK, like when she talks about like, well, I asked him about, you know, do you have good credit? Do you have a 401k, blah, blah, blah. It's like she was very much involved in their finances. Like she even suggested that he open his own bank account and starts putting stuff aside. And so it was like, to me, I think that that kind of points to like very possible that she was kind of like, you know, she just spends all this money and, you know, you, um, deserve more than what she's doing blah, blah blah and she like talks about her life uh nk talks about shanann's job not really being a real job and that it was sort of a sedentary lifestyle um so it just seemed like there were like subliminal messages that nk even says in her own interviews that kind of point to her being like disgusted about um shanann's spending habits and stuff like that um but i do think that knowing there was not very many many assets when Shanann died, it kind of does kind of point towards like, okay, so he was just fed up and like wanted easy money back. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And debt can be very stressful. Like, I mean, that's one of the biggest life stressors is money. So, mm -hmm. and I think NK kind of preyed on that. Definitely, I agree. We moved across the country, but if you were friends with Shanann Watts on Facebook, you knew what her life was like because Shanann was not shy about posting videos, putting so many videos on her Facebook of her girls and of her husband and even of their cute little dog Dieter. And she live streamed right from the living room of that beautiful Colorado home. And if you ever pictured Shanann at home, you probably pictured her with phone in hand, ready to capture anything that happened. In fact, a family member telling me Shanann was never, ever, ever without that phone. Which makes you wonder just where her phone was when she got back from that business trip. Where her phone was while she was being killed and why that phone apparently ended up wedged between the cushions of the upstairs sofa. Joining me now, Karen Smith, a retired detective with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and forensics specialist as well. Karen, thanks so much for being here. I need you to walk me through this. I have gone over so many scenarios in my mind. Why that phone was discovered between the, the cushions on the, on the sofa upstairs at the landing. If you go up to the second floor of the Watts home, there's a landing and it's kind of like a family room landing with that sofa right there. Somewhere wedged in those pillows was Shanann's phone. And it's something the police said they found out eventually. So walk me through the scenarios of how that could be because when I come home from a business trip, my phone's in my hand. That's right, exactly. Your phone is in your hand. You charge it next to the dresser, next to the bed. That's where mine is, most people's are. Things don't just happen. The phone was in the couch because someone 
put it there. It was wedged between two cushions because somebody stuck it in there, likely in an attempt to conceal it from law enforcement. Didn't want it found for some reason. I'm not sure what that reason might be, but you know, it, the, the couch is leather, it's slick. When my phone didn't have a cover on it, it was slippery as well, it's glass. You know, to say it would slide between the two cushions is highly unlikely to me. If it was found between them, someone, read Chris Watts, put it there. See, this is where I disagree with this detective. Like, I think that it's more likely that NK put that phone there. Yeah. Now, it's hard to know because her phone was shut off, so we don't have, like, it pinging places. Um, but from what I know, and correct me if I'm wrong, the last kind of whereabouts that we know was in the house and we don't know of it, you know, leaving when Chris left in the truck. Um, but we do wonder who was left in the house as he left. Didn't her phone say that there was a flight of stairs climbed shortly after she got home? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think that was her Apple watch. But I think they might have been synced together. So maybe they both would have shown like the flight of stairs. I think that um, the steps and stuff like that can be found on both devices. If it wasn't the watch, then yeah, it was the phone that recorded that. Um, but yeah, I, I just think it's more likely, like we've always speculated, they couldn't figure out the new password, which she had just recently changed like on that Arizona trip. And the whole thing was he was going to pose as Shanann or somebody who had her phone who's involved with Chris was going to pose as Shanann and like respond to people who was messaging her. Like when Nicole Atkinson messaged her that day, um, instead of getting no response, somebody who had the password was probably going to be like, oh, don't worry, I'm fine. Or, you know, don't bother stopping by. But they couldn't get into her phone because she had just recently changed her password to the baby's due date and nobody knew it. So I think like when the plan starts crumbling and Nicole Atkinson shows up and then the cops show up, somebody ditched that phone like then and there in that in that couch. Like they weren't able to get through in her phone in the password yet. So rather than I think destroying it or like burying it or whatever they like hit it in the couch cushions and we're like we'll get back to that maybe and then they never were able to what do you think i do i wonder i want to know if chris knew it was in the couch you know but i do think the password chain had a big part of the plan kind of falling apart um Mm -hmm. so yeah i i don't necessarily feel like chris is the one that put it there i do think that the choice of where it was left is very interesting like why they're out of everywhere in the house yeah yeah that is interesting like of all places to hide it why there like why not and that's what leads me to think that they had hoped that their plan would still be able to like take place, like keep the phone around in case like we need it. Don't throw it out or anything like they yes. you, don't put it in the washer or in the water where it got damaged. Keep it so that they knew where to find it. You know, once the cops leave or whatever, maybe they could still carry out their plan. And then Chris tells them, like, no, they're watch. I'm under surveillance now, or they don't think I should leave, or they're going to come back and do a search warrant. And then everything's like, wait, what? And by then, they had already found the phone. Right. And I just really wonder, like, did Chris underestimate how soon people would react? Because I know for me, I think I could be missing <laughs> a little while before anybody actually, like, called about me. Because yeah. I've disappeared quite a bit. <laughs> So it's like, I just wonder if he really understated that. Yeah. I mean, when I was editing this video, I like checked my text messages and I was like, nobody has even texted me like during, <laughs> that, during that whole time. Um, I think what really was like also the problem too is as much as like NK probably wanted an argument to arise from the lazy dog receipt to be seen at the bar. I think that that like, 
upset Shanann so much around her friends that they were on high alert because of like, oh yeah, she thinks that he's cheating on her. She saw this like charge on their um, card. And so we're really, really worried about her. Like it, in hindsight, it's like maybe if they wanted to keep things yes. filled, like maybe NK should have paid in cash. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I almost wonder too, like, you know, we've kind of theorized, like, was Chris getting cold feet or trying to back away or back out? He, you know, she said he wasn't interested in the apartment search. That I like, getting sorry, he's not interested. You let, cut out a little. Let bit. me have this. Yeah. Okay, sorry. I might try to join through my phone. Is it cutting out a lot or? Just a little okay bit. Okay, now I know that you're like making a good point. You're saying that he, there were things about him that NK was saying that he might have been backing out of, like when they talked about the um the apartment searches, and she said something like he didn't seem very interested in it, and that you're insinuating possibly it was more than just the apartments that he was backing out of. But NK, of course, isn't going to tell law enforcement that. Right. And so maybe she was like, well, let me get him to use his card so that Shanann hopefully will see it. And then yeah. he can't back out. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point to kind of be like, OK, well, if you're serious about this, then then pay for this right now. Yeah. And if you're not going to pay for it, then we're going to question and I say we are because I think there's more people involved in that lazy dog Saturday night. We're going to question if you're really in this for real. Kyle, the notion that this family, after all they have gone through, trying to deal with the reality of losing their daughter, their granddaughters, burying them in North Carolina, found themselves on a phone call, the first confrontation with Chris Watts since they lost Shanann. That was the big question today. We knew they had a phone call scheduled. Would Chris Watts himself actually be on that call? He dialed in today from the Weld County Jail with his attorney sitting right beside him. So he has two attorneys for his murder case. And the DA has been very clear to us, hey, this probate issue that has been launched by Shanann's family, this is not part of the criminal case. This is not part of the DA's office. This is a civil matter separate from us. And yet, both of those attorneys and the DA himself were involved in this phone call. How were they all placed? Who was where and why? That's right. You said it. The DA for a long time has been... So this phone call, I'd love to know more about, and I don't think we ever know like what this phone call was actually about. And hello, Scottish Queen, good to see you. Um, so the Shanann's family is on the call, and um, his attorney, Chris's attorneys, are present with him on this call, saying, "Hey, this is a uh, uh, civil case, not a criminal. We have nothing to do with that." But um, the prosecutor himself uh, was actually in court today. Michael Rourke. Michael Rourke in court. In court, although it seems he was there as a visitor. He was he was in the courtroom gallery, as was another one of Chris Watts' defense attorneys, uh, John, John Walsh. John Walsh? Yeah. So John Walsh and uh, his other defense attorney for the criminal case, Kate Harold, of course, they're involved in defending him against these murder charges, the nine felonies that he's faced with. But Kate Harold somehow was in the jail, seated beside Chris Watts on this phone call with the family and his other attorney and the big cheese himself, Michael Work, were sitting in the gallery in the courtroom, presumably on speakerphone with the judge. Exactly. Kate Harold was right there with Chris. Um, and as you said, she's the one uh, tasked with defending him in this murder case. Um, so, one of his attorneys and, in the courtroom. So he gets on the phone and on the other end, invited to be part of this call, critically is Shanann's father. That's Frank Rusick. You can see on the, the list of people involved here. Critically, uh, Frank Rusick, the father of the murdered pregnant wife of Chris Watts, is on that phone call. He is the one petitioning to say, I want to be Shanann's personal representative in all of the affairs of her estate. I want to be that person, that point person. Sandy Rusick, his wife, Shanann's mom, also invited to be on the call. Frankie Rusick, Shanann's brother, and, you know, by all accounts, best friend on the call as well. And then you can see uh, uh, all the lawyers uh, that we just talked about. Do we know if that family, if Frank Sr. or Sandy or Frank Jr., who has known to be 
be very outspoken about what he thinks of Chris Watts on Facebook. Do we know if they spoke to him? We have no idea who spoke on that call. Um, and a big question too is, did Chris even utter a word on that call or were his attorneys talking for him? We don't know, but it's pretty, it had to have been pretty chilling um, and very uncomfortable for that family if Chris Watts was speaking. When I take my makeup off, you always want to, two things first, wash your hands and two, wash your makeup off first. Always wash your makeup off first um, before washing it with cleanser. Hey, Chris. Yes, sir. Can you grab me my charger with the wall plug, please? I have to wet. Why is what, Sharon? I'm gonna wash. Yeah, a lot of people, I never even, I don't remember hearing about that call that they had. And the fact that the district attorney Rourke was like in the courtroom, you know, overseeing it. Um, do you think, do you know anything about this phone call? No, I don't remember hearing anything about it. It makes me wonder if it was like recorded too. Like, is there yeah. a copy out there that we just never heard about or what? But so this is going to go into more of um, Shanann and Chris's dynamic. Um, we're almost done. But at this point in the stage of the game, um, there's Facebook groups hearing about the probable cause affidavit that claims that Shanann killed the girls. So Chris killed Shanann. And people are really starting to believe that narrative. So I think that Ashley Banfield was kind of exploring the dynamic between them as we would do, even if Shanann was never blamed. You know, you want to know, like, what was this couple like? Um, so that's what this is sort of about. I think it's interesting to see, and I'll explain why in a minute. Funny go up. Again, you guys, no judgment after this uh, video here. Um, I'm really surprised. Chris is like, I'm surprised you're doing it. I was like, I know. He knows me. Mm -hmm. I should make Chris go pour me a glass of wine. Hey, Chris. He's doing laundry. I hear him in the laundry room. Um, <laughs> he needs to get me my wine. So, um, very little bit. Jody wants to know where my wine is. Um, doing laundry, I told her. Yeah. He's only kids laundry. laundry. We don't um, dry the kids' clothes, so he's hanging them because he's he's being a good dad and helping me out. You just say the word and I'll make him wash his face. I'll throw another video on here just a minute doing his face. Um, he does whatever I tell him to anyway, so he'll do it. Give me five minutes, Jody, and um, I'll go get him from the laundry room and have him wash his face. Hey, Chris. Yes. Um, you're wanted. Uh. Okay. So something I noticed in that little clip, while HLN wasn't really honing in on this, of course, after we receive all the information with NK and, you know, have been digging into this, there was something that just stuck out to me. So we're going to rewind a little bit and hear something that Shanann says, because we've heard something very similar from NK. He does whatever I tell him to anyway, so he'll do it. But I can tell you right now if I would have texted him and just say whatever I needed to say. There. Sorry, that was so loud for NKs, but it's part of like the hidden mic interview, so it's hard to hear. But that's where she's saying, I can tell you right now if I were to text him and say whatever I needed to say, he would do it. And it's just so eerily similar to Shanann saying like, he does whatever I say, he'll do it. And it's very much like I've shown in my um, documentary. There's a part where Shanann's talking on a Facebook stream and she says, you know, I just, you got to read, reading, blah, blah, blah. And it's talking about reading. And then it flashes to NK talking about reading. And she's like, you know, you just got to read. Um, you know, I always tell people to read. And it's like, to me, yes, it's not proven, but it just is like circumstantial evidence that just points towards like, NK was watching and like stalking everything Shanann did. And for her, I to, agree with that. Yeah. And for her to see that video and, and she's probably like, oh, he does everything she just says. Well, he'll do everything I say too, I bet. Mm -hmm. You know, and then she works towards doing that um, and, and getting him to do that for her. 
But sh there's more, I'm sure there's more instances too, where Shanann says something in a live stream. In fact, I think you pointed it out where she calls the kids kiddos. Yeah. She'll be like us and the kiddos or the kiddos, this and that. And then NK's talking and she says the kiddos. And people were like, oh, everyone, a lot of people use that phrase. But I think it's more than that. Like, I think it's more than just, oh, people in Colorado use that term a lot. Like, I think that it it points towards just a very close stalking of Shanann done by the mistress here. Right. And even like Ashley Banfield was like, you can learn a lot about Shanann's life literally just by going to her Facebook page. So, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Ashley from the news media is mentioning that. Imagine what NK did with her me social media. Yeah. It's just very like unsettling. And, you know, the defense team, who knows what what area this would have gone down, but the defense team would have had a field day kind of honing in on like, you stalked this family. We have proof that you were cyber stalking this family a year before working with Chris, blah, 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 blah. You know, but that just never ended up happening, unfortunately. He does whatever I tell him to anyway, so he'll do it. But I can tell you right now if I would have touched him and just say whatever I needed to say. There is so much being said online in the dozens of Facebook groups and the tens of thousands of followers of these Facebook groups, these members. Everyone is tearing each piece of interaction between this couple apart and ascribing some kind of an attitude to it. What do you see in that video? So I see a dad who is so cute. He is hanging up his daughter's little purple pajamas and he's doing exactly what his wife wants. What woman doesn't want a husband that does all of that for her, right? He's gonna get her a glass of wine. He gets her her charger. He just smiles nicely and she says, oh, he's gonna do whatever I want. I'm gonna wash his face. What a good guy. He obviously is a big football fan. He's got a Steeler shirt on. Not only does he love football, but he loves getting a facial from his wife. Super cute. But you can see that perhaps what critics might catch on there is that perhaps that his wife, when she says he does whatever I say, fast forward to what happens years later, she is not alive, their children are gone, he's been accused of murdering all three of them. Perhaps this shows a crack in their relationship. I mean, it's so difficult for the surviving family members to, you know, to, to see everything that's happened since the murders bad enough they've lost their loved ones but then to hear sort of the armchair quarterbacking of of shenan being somehow at fault uh, and and i really do think that like even though this lady's talking about there being a possible crack like i think that that was the crack that nk kind of preyed on too like she's so bossy or does she ever give you a say and how she emulated herself to be totally different because chris will come out and say like I just felt like I was in more control and that I could, uh, that I was being heard. Like those, not those exact words, but something along those lines. And that's not how NK really is in real life. I think she was purposely putting on a mask after studying Shanann and realizing like, okay, well, I'm going to do it differently so that he gets hooked on the way that I'm treating him rather than his wife. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, I just can't help but wonder like, was Chris, like, again, we don't know, like, was Chris really bothered by it until NK came along and really brought it all up? I don't know. Right. Exactly. Like, I, I really think, like, if they were going to head towards divorce, it would have been something that Shanann maybe was working towards. Um, mm -hmm. I do think that she did kind of feel around with that divorce lawyer at that hibachi Um restaurant as like just doing her homework like if if we did end up getting divorced you know what would i expect right um but yeah i agree i don't think that it would have been like pushed by chris at all like he would not have been contacting a divorce lawyer first yeah agree there are plenty of people online who say this when in fact i think anybody who's ever done a selfie video could say they do the same thing if they're performing they ask someone off camera to go grab something for them or do something for them let me bring in dr greg case and if i can psychologist i i'm you know I, I am frustrated by the idea that facebook followers can beat up on a person who's already been victimized and her children but at the same time 
I don't have the trained eye. I can't really, I can't really look into that video the way you could. Yes, well, you know, uh, I hate to even side with those Facebook viewers that I think there are some problems here in the video. I think it reveals more than a crack. I do think Shannon is truly the victim here, but in this video, in this video alone, you see that her style is more of a domineering style. So that she's she tells her husband what to do. And I think that lends a little bit more to the narrative of how this could have all gone down. She See, I don't think that like he really cared, like we were just discussing. Like, of course, at this stage and them reporting on this, like it might be something that they want to discuss. And this guy being a psychologist, he might know a little bit about couples like this and how one of them just gets fed up after a while. But I think that really NK being there and saying like, look how she treats you. She doesn't let you see your family. You need to speak to your family more. Um, I think that he never would have seen these things on his own. And that's why we always say that NK was the catalyst that kind of, you know, lit the fire under Chris um, changing. Cause you know, Shanann says he's totally changed in the last five weeks. I don't know what happened. I don't know him anymore. And I think that it was like brainwashing in a way and, and maybe drug use and obviously sex, um, all that being tied in all influenced and initiated by NK. Yeah. And again, like not excusing any of it, but even Joseph Scott Morgan said when something like you play that hard and fast, you have to look at the an outlier. And who was that? It was NK. Right. Exactly. And thank you, Era, for um, your comments and for gifting memberships and welcome to the members. She could have been the leader in the relationship and he could have been the follower in the relationship. And one day he did finally crack. And that's where the crack probably happened in the relationship. But I don't see her as as the perpetrator at all. It's just the nature of the relationship they had together. Look, I don't understand the defense position here being so cavalier about the results. I wouldn't want those results out. I would take a definitive position here because it, both sides need to protect witnesses. Both sides need to protect taint, not just one side or the other. The prosecution is zeroing in right now on their experts, who are they going to have uh, consult, who they're going to have testify at trial. So protecting that information is actually important and it works to protect both sides. Well, let me let me read something from the defense motion, and it's about Chris Watts' rights being damaged. Um, this was language, and I'm going to ask our, our control room to grab that full screen number four for me, because I think this is really telling. It's kind of legalese, but it gets really, I guess it really gets down and dirty to what the defense wants the public to know. And let me read here. Mr. Watts writes to a fundamental fair proceeding and ultimately a fair and impartial jury at trial have been so substantially damaged in this case it does not seem that any prophylactic order at least on the narrow issue issue of whether the autopsy should be released can serve to salvage the wreckage of those rights which may remain it's really and I think that maybe the defense had a leg to stand on, like claiming that, you know, rights were tampered on. And, and I'm not saying that we're defending Chris at all, but from everything that kind of took place, I think even at one point, Ronnie mentions a lawyer to Tammy and Coder and like, it's kind of ignored. Am I wrong there? No, I do feel like there was a mention and I know, I remember Ronnie even mentions it when it's just him and Chris, I believe. And then it, like, I think you're right. Then they come in and it's mentioned at some point again, if I remember correctly, but it was totally brushed over. Yeah. And I think Ronnie says something about like how much longer should, are they going to be there for or something like that. And Tammy was like, like not, didn't say that they can't leave, but pretty much like made him think that they couldn't leave when really at that moment, like they, even after he quote unquote failed the polygraph, because guys, we've never actually seen the full results and all, and all the technical um, information about the polygraph. We've just been told he failed with this, um, whatever his results were, we've never actually seen it. So, but anyways, um, 
he, they could have walked out. They still could have walked out and because there was nothing linking him to this crime besides his confession. And that confession was false. And yet they were like made to believe that they couldn't. And then we're hearing about the defense team wanting to swab um, the necks of the children and the judge denies it. So, and then the media, the law enforcement telling the media the night of that he confessed at killing all of them, which never took place. So there were so many things that were kind of, um, I think in the defense's favor to say like, we're not in a position for this guy to have a fair trial, like not right now. Um, and they were, doing uh, court ordered um, filings about keeping the media away and stuff. There's all this stuff um, we'd have to go through, but they were very much like concerned for Chris's constitutional rights at the time. And again, I do think that he is where he needs to be, but I do think that if this went to trial, it would have been so much more interesting to kind of see his defense. Agree dramatic stuff if you're a lawyer. <laughs> it's maybe not as dramatic for a Hollywood script, but it's dramatic stuff if you're a lawyer. I'm trying to get to what this means, Rini. Are they trying to suggest over and over and over and over again to anyone who will listen, juries or judges, we're already doomed in this process? They have to. It's a murder case with the penalty being death. They have to raise it and re-raise it and re-raise it and say that it's so cumulatively cumulatively impacts this man's rights that he cannot have a fair trial. They have to set up an appeal from the beginning before they've even tried the case. So they will continue to re-raise it. Okay, so there's this other little uh, nugget. And again, it sounds kind of legalese, but I'm gonna get to it. So you have to kind of bear with me. And this okay. question's for you, Pat. Um, this is from the, de the defense motion about these autopsy results, basically saying, you know, go ahead, court, make your decision. It doesn't matter either way for us if you release those autopsies to the public or not. But this is this is from full screen number two. That's for our control room. If you want to just pull this one up. And this says the government has made no further proffer with respect to which witnesses it intends to interview that have not been interviewed nor how those witnesses, what they have to say, could be impacted by the contents of the autopsies. I, I'm no lawyer, Pat, but it sounds to me <laughs> like they're trying to, they're angling for the prosecution to give them a list. We want well, to know who I, you're talking to. It, it, it sounds to me, it's a lot like me watching my dog chase its tail. I mean, that's what I feel like when I read some of these, these motions. And of course, your lawyer can speak more profoundly to this, but they're trying to make this argument that all this damage has been done and it's so blatant and it's irreparable. And that's really what they're pinning the case on that you haven't told us who the witnesses are. And so how do we know whether witnesses can be tarnished? It's just like these circular arguments. Now, I'm not saying they're bad attorneys. I'm just saying for me as a journalist, what exactly, what a point are they trying to make? And the point is that they're just trying to slam as much against the wall to say that this guy has been damaged and can't get a fair trial as they possibly can. So I think that that's interesting that they were, the defense was looking towards knowing like, who the prosecution was going to use as their witnesses. They're obviously trying to figure out a strategy in court. Um, and then we know that the mistress here on the screen, looking all creepy, um, was on the def or on the prosecution's witness list. So at the time, they're, you know, kind of wondering what was going on. And then in prison, we end up hearing through Chris that his lawyers reached out numerous times to Nicole Kessinger's lawyers and her herself. And they were pretty much told like, stop calling. Um, she's not going to speak with you. And then next thing you know, the plea deal is signed. She's not needed for uh, her witness statement and everything's just said and done and everything goes away. Um, everything that was going to be interviewed on as far as more police interviews and investigations just never takes place. And here we are. What do you think about um, the defense team wondering about the witness list? I mean, that's sort of normal for both sides to kind of be wondering, like, what evidence are they using against us or what evidence do they have? Um, and thank you, Valerie, for being a member for 29 months. She said, thank you for all your hard work. Love your lives. And you've been um, supporting CDT and I for so long. And we would love having you in our chat. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you. And it's good to see you, Valerie. 
Um, I'm trying to think where I was, what I was going to say. Oh yeah. I think it's, of course, I think everything is interesting. Like every little thing interests me. I know I use that word a lot, but I also thought it was, um, telling just kind of how they pointed out, like who they hadn't interviewed yet. And I mean, now we know, like, we don't have any public interview of like Cindy, Jamie, and it's like, again, who wasn't interviewed? Exactly. And, and, um, leave Jim alone. Oh, yes. Um, so many things that are just so questionable. Um, and that's why we're still discussing this years later. Otherwise, we can discuss cases, go through their trials, or just realize, like, poor Summer Wells, like, I've not let go of hope but it's not something that I can keep jumping down that rabbit hole and finding like stuff to go through because there's not like a lot of new statements from law enforcement. There's not a discovery file to go through like in this case. Um, so it's just, there's other thing, other cases that kind of go away for us in a way, you know, and it's like, this one just doesn't seem to be wanting to go away. Where is proof of plea deal? Haven't found anything. There is like, um, court filings and, and real, um, Colorado court documents that definitely point towards a uh, plea deal that took place. Um, besides just the district attorney and the media and everyone kind of reporting on it, you can find court documents that pretty much show he signed this, it shows his signature, everything's, um, said and done and, and legit as far as there being a real, um, plea deal that he signed. And thank you for the super chat. I hope that answered your question. Is that what you mean? And thank you, Carol freaking Claus for being a member for nine months. Thank you very much for the kind words. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much all I have to say tonight is just leave this stuff here. Obviously the death investigator, um, was going down the avenue that we kind of all are stuck on. And it's like, okay, so if it wasn't Shanann that killed the girls and Chris is claiming he didn't do it, um, he's either a liar, obviously, or there's somebody else or other people that is around this family that should be looked into. And that's pretty much the whole point of the live stream is it, it's not just us um, that are kind of going down this avenue of like, oh, what about this person? This is suspicious, this coworker or this mistress. Um, there were experts who were definitely like, I really hope that they're, you know, entertaining the idea that it could be an outlier in this fam of this family that did this crime. So any right. last thoughts? No, I just I enjoy going back through this and like re-looking at it all. And once again, I can't help but wonder like if the plea deal hadn't happened. And NK was, like Ashley Banfield said, like right square in the middle of a murder trial. Like just how it would have all played out if a, like one little thing could have gone differently with his interview with Tammy and Coder. Like and it all could have played out differently, I think. I agree. And yeah, Valerie, I think that we want, eventually yeah. we're going to do a live stream of statements made not only by Chris, but there were some things even Ronnie was saying that was like, wait, what? What yes. did he say that? Didn't he say something like, is that when they left? Yeah, like I think he told her or had told Ronnie, you know, Shanann, or like, I don't even think he used Shanann's name, but basically like she's the one that did it. And then Ronnie says something like, so did they leave after that? And it's like, what? You just told him that Shanann or somebody had harmed the girls. But yeah, we definitely should relook into all of that. Yeah, there's there's a lot to kind of point out. Um, Leticia says, I still can't believe that NK is such a narc that she did a publicity photo shoot for her media. <laughs> right? Yes. And she didn't even come out until the plea deal was signed. Now, is yeah. that because she was being protected because she was going to be a witness? I don't know. I mean, I feel like wasn't. Amber Fry, a witness in the trial, and she was still out there. Like, she was apologizing to Lacey's family. I didn't know about right. her, and I'm sorry. And yet, it, we see the total opposite behavior 
um, done by NK. And again, obviously behavior doesn't always mean guilt or, or point towards guilt, but they use Chris's behavior against him. So I'm going to do the same for NK because that's just how sometimes you perceive situations. But exactly. I mean, and another reason why it kind of ties into what we were talking about earlier that I believe that money was the motivator is I think that NK somehow was thinking she was going to get some money too, because as soon as this whole thing kind of crumbles and she's being interviewed by police and stuff, they find out that she's searching things like Amber Fry's net worth, Amber Fry's book deal. So it seemed like to me, in my opinion, she still wasn't ready to let go of the idea of like, I need money or I'm supposed to get money out of this whole mess. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like she wanted something for herself out of it. Cause why else are you looking up Amber Frey or Amber Fry's net worth? And yeah, she's like, okay, our initial plan failed. Yeah. Let me see if I can maybe go on a media run and make income that way. Yeah. And but again, like not everyone will perceive that as the way I've said it, but to mm -hmm. me, it really does seem like they had this whole plan and, you know, he was looking up Audis that were much like the Lexus model. It was like a family SUV and, you know, all that was before the murders happened. Like what money did he think he was going to come into at that time to, to get an Audi, you know, and it was a family vehicle, which kind of points to me, like the kids weren't in his plan. He still planned on having an SUV. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, we could keep going on and on, but I appreciate you coming on with me tonight. I'm adding the Thursday night stream um, as like the extra stream. I don't know if you realize I've been going live three times a week instead of two. I've upped my game mm -hmm. um, because we just know this case like the back of our hand. So I figure I should probably keep up with other cases on my other nights to go live and just do the Watts live as like my extra live. But I appreciate you being here, Kelly. And guys, the TikTok link is at the top of the chat. If you're on TikTok and you like um, true crime, then you should definitely follow her over there. And again, thank you to my moderators and everyone who donated. Thank you guys for being here. Kelly, you're always welcome to join me again next week if you want. No pressure. It won't be this late, I don't think, because it was kind of like out of the norm tonight to go this late. But I'll keep everyone updated, but thank you so much and goodbye, everybody. Yeah, thanks for having me and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye. <laughs> okay, bye.